Merry Christmas! It is the 10th day of Christmas today, and Happy New Year! I'm Pastor Maria Markman, Associate Pastor of Faith Formation here at Grace Lutheran Church, and we are grateful that you have joined us for worship today. Just a few announcements before we begin our worship together. Tomorrow night, Monday, January 4th, join us via Zoom for our Waking Up White book study. This is part of our ongoing commitment to understanding our place as a church and as individuals in the story of race in the United States. Please register on Gracelink so you can get our prep resources. Uh, You need not read the whole book, but know that we do still have a few copies of Waking Up White in the church office should you need them. We do ask that before you join us that you do familiarize yourself with our resources, our chapter summaries, and questions prior to our Zoom gathering at 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday, June 6th, it is Epiphany. Uh, Please join us that evening from 6.30 to 7.30 for an Epiphany party. Uh, We invite you to dress in costume, come hear stories about when the kings came to visit baby Jesus, and even make your own crown. We look forward to having you join us then. Next week in worship, we will hear the story of Jesus' baptism, and so on that day, we will be having a Connection Sunday at noon, Uh, so this is January 10th. Uh, We invite everyone to come, pick up communion, um, 
say hello, pray with the pastor, and children's ministry will be there having a baptismal celebration party out in the snow. So dress for playing in the snow. We plan to play in the snow. It's going to be a very, very good time. For other upcoming opportunities and different ways to give, please check out our weekly e-newsletter, Grace at a Glance, or our monthly newsletter that gets mailed out, Grace Notes, or Give us a call. We would love to hear from you. With that, let us begin our worship service. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now let us together confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Let us pray. Gracious God, have have mercy mercy on us. us. We We confess confess that we have turned from you and given given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and and humbly repent. repent. In In your compassion, compassion, forgive forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power of the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your heart through faith. Amen. Amen. And now, let us sing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. God of all learning, when, when the, the boy, boy Jesus stayed in the temple to learn from the elders, it was, it was the, the elders who in turn, turn learned from him. him. Teach us, Lord, as, as you have taught others, and grant us wisdom and willingness to learn. Amen. Amen. Hello, boys and girls. I hope you all had a good Christmas and a happy new year. Today, we hear a story about Jesus as a 12-year-old. It is one of the few times that we get to hear about Jesus as a kid. And in this story that you're going to hear in just a couple minutes, Jesus gets separated from his parents. He actually kind of goes to the temple without telling them. Now, the temple is kind of like church. It's their spiritual home, a place where they go to worship and to give thanks to God. And when Jesus gets to the temple, he wants to go and talk to the leaders. He has questions he wants to know about God, about faith. I wonder what some of the questions Jesus asked are. Do you have questions about God? I do. Here are some of the things I wonder about. I wonder what God looks like. I wonder what God thinks about our world. I wonder some days what God wants me to do about a tough decision I have to make. What are some of your questions? I hope that you will go and talk to a loved one and say some of your questions and share them with each other. I want you to know this, that you can bring your questions about God to church, that you can bring them to me or Pastor Maria or any of our leaders, and that we want to hear what you wonder about. I also want you to know that we don't always have the answers. There is a lot of things about God that I just don't know. But one of the really fun parts, I think, about being in faith and living in faith together is that we get to wonder together. And that your ideas about God and my ideas about God might be different, but when we share them with each other, our ideas and images of God grow bigger and bigger. And God is pretty big, bigger than I can imagine and I think God wants us to keep learning and growing so that we might see God in so many places and things. So my hope for you all is to ask questions and know that the faithful adults in your life don't always have the answers, but when you share them together, you can all grow in your understanding of God and of each other. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for inviting us to ask questions. Thank you so much for Jesus and his example. Thank you for faithful leaders who listen and wonder with us. Thank you for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading for today is recorded in the book of Psalms, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. I will tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Bye. 
The gospel for today is recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in a group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he had said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother, his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The Gospel of Our Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My youth director in junior high has a distinct memory of me sitting in her office and asking big questions of faith. She recalls that at one point I asked if God could be so big that God could create a rock so enormous that even God couldn't move it. I now shake my head at this particular question. But I do remember that I had many questions when it came to faith that would often overwhelm my youth director, and then she would send me down the hall to the pastors to ask my questions. I am thankful that she took me serious enough not to dismiss my questions, but instead guided me and helped me find people who would wonder and explore alongside me. Teenagers often ask big questions. They no longer accept the things that we tell them as fact without asking for backup information, or they explore new ideas. My own kids, in fact, will periodically present me with an idea or something they've learned that I have never heard before. And so I find myself learning more and more through them, and I'm grateful. This is the only story in the Gospels about Jesus as a tween. He is 12 years old, and lucky for Jesus, no one documented his adolescence in details like most of us probably have pictures of. I think most of us wouldn't mind if there was only one story of the stupid things we did when we were tweens or teens, right? But I am sure that this story was one that his parents told again and again. Remember when Jesus didn't bother to leave with the caravan like he was supposed to? Remember when Jesus disappeared for three days and stayed in the big city? Remember when we found Jesus in the temple asking the leaders all those questions? Remember the day when Jesus started to teach us instead of the other way around? When Jesus stays behind in the temple after the Passover, he does so because he is curious. He recognizes that there is something more about the world than he has seen in Nazareth. He has questions about God, about faith, and perhaps even about our world. And even though he is God in the flesh, he is human too, learning, growing, discovering. Jesus goes to the temple to ask questions, wanting to learn from people who are outside his home and village, who might have a diverse opinion than himself or his parents, and to gain new perspectives for him to contemplate. 
When his parents find him in the temple, the text tells us that they didn't understand what he told them. They didn't understand what he was up to. We are also told that they were frightened. I am sure that they were frightened because Jesus was lost, according to them, of course. But I wonder if they might have been frightened, too, by the questions that Jesus was asking. Was he asking questions that they had been told not to ask about God, about faith, about life? Was Jesus inviting them to see things that they hadn't seen before? Yes, this might be the first time we see Jesus doing this in his ministry, but it becomes the way he functions as a leader, asking hard questions, helping people to see new realities, inviting people to stretch themselves. That's what he asks of us as his followers for us to ask questions too and to look at our world with new eyes, the eyes of God, eyes of compassion, eyes of welcome, eyes that invite us to love God by loving our neighbor. In the month of January, we are inviting everyone in the congregation to read the book Waking Up White by Debbie Irving. A small group starts this Monday night Um, January 4th, I hope that you will consider attending it or at the very least reading the book. We have two copies over at the church right now waiting to be loaned out. What I like about this book is that it gives us an opportunity to reflect on our own upbringing and our own experience when it comes to race in the United States. It also invites us to ask hard questions Questions about what it means to live in a white culture and how this has influenced our lives and our communities and our care for people of color. I read this book a few years ago and have been asking myself some of the questions that Debbie Irving asks in these books and asking further questions about how understanding race relations impacts my life and my faith and my call as a Christian. I will confess that I'm not always happy with what I discover about myself, but nevertheless, I believe that God is encouraging me to keep wondering, exploring, and learning. So today, for part of my message, I wanted to share a little bit about what I've learned about myself through these questions. I grew up in the Twin Cities in the 1980s and 90s, and when I think back about that experience and what I was taught about race, what I was really taught was to not ask questions when it came to racial diversity. Once a year in school, we would learn about Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. We got a limited view of slavery and thought of it as a thing of the past. In the 80s and 90s, it seems like the best thing to do was to not see skin color, which now I realize was an improvement over the way my parents were raised because for their generation, they were either not exposed at all, like my mother who was raised in rural South Dakota and never had seen a person of color till she moved to the big city, or they saw active and visible discrimination. My dad taught me that we were all equal and that skin color didn't matter. He took Martin Luther King Jr.'s words to heart that it wasn't about the color of the skin but the content of the character, which indeed was an improvement. But in this environment, I never learned about my own white culture and the influence it had on everything I experienced. I didn't realize that whiteness influenced the makeup of my neighborhood, that it gave me an advantage over others when it came to education and economics, and I didn't realize how it impacted the city of the, that I was raised in, and that racism is something that we deal with every day whether we know it or not. I'm grateful for my parents and the ways they taught me to care for other people. They did not teach discrimination but acceptance, but at the same time, I learned racism in unspoken ways. 
when car doors would be locked in certain neighborhoods, or the ways people around me would respond when we would see a black man walking down the street toward us. I just assumed that this was the way things were. When I moved to the south side of Chicago for seminary, I would ride the L train from the northern suburbs where all of my friends lived after getting jobs after college, back down to Hyde Park in the south side, and I would watch the train change colors from white to black as we moved further south. It became evident to me that even in the year 2000, segregation was alive and well in our city, but I assumed that this was Chicago and wasn't present in my own community. I was wrong. A few years ago, my family and I were biking through the neighborhoods of Edina and Hopkins, Minnetonka, and St. Louis Park, and as we biked along the trail, I saw the neighborhoods change color just like I did on that train. We would bike in one section and enter a Somali neighborhood, another an East Indian, another a Latino, another black and white. Our neighborhoods were segregated, and I hadn't even realized. My children attend a school that is about 45% white, but our neighborhoods are divided by race and economics, and we parents struggle to connect with one another. More often than not, I have realized that my children are the ones who are leading me and helping guide this discussion when it comes to overcoming racial divides. They know a lot more than I do, and they have learned and grown up alongside people who are different than them, and they accept them for who they are and know them. Twelve-year-old Jesus challenges Mary and Joseph and the leaders of the church with his questions and answers. And we don't know what he was asking, but I'm sure that they were questions that we would want to ponder as well. Kids ask questions that invite us to think about things differently. My children do the same, and perhaps your children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren do too. What I have discovered, though, is that while our children will indeed lead us in this and are a source of hope that they cannot do it alone, we need to take this journey with them. We need to be a part of the conversation. We need to learn from them and with them, too. As we enter 2021, I know that most of us are longing to start fresh and leave all the difficulty of the last year behind us. We want to talk about hope and possibilities and forget things like the pandemic and the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the race riots that happened in the Twin Cities. I know some of you are wishing that we could just be done with this conversation about race or wondering why we even need to discuss it in church. I wish we could be done with this conversation because if we were, that would mean our world had changed and it wasn't a problem anymore. But it is, and we can't not talk about it. Talking about hard things and working for justice is a part of our faith. Asking hard questions about ourselves and our world and God is essential. It is what Jesus teaches us to do. Jesus does not come to comfort the comfortable, but instead to shake things up because there are so many people who are uncomfortable, who are left out, who are overlooked and unheard. And this is who Jesus tells us we need to pay attention to, to welcome in. The kingdom of heaven that Jesus pronounces is for all people. And he cannot welcome all when we fail to hear the cries of people who are telling us that there is a problem in our own country. And when it comes to race in the United States, our friends and our neighbors of color who are black and brown are telling us that there is a problem. It is not a problem that just a few of us need to address, but one that each of us needs to confront, one that I need to confront day after day, knowing so often that I don't get it right, knowing that I'm going to put my foot in my mouth and say the wrong things and offend someone, 
And knowing at the same time that as people of faith, we are people of confession who have a God of forgiveness. See, Jesus doesn't only invite us to ask hard questions. He extends his arms in love and grace. The 12-year-old boy in the temple doesn't stay a tween but grows up to be the savior of the world, your savior and mine. A savior who indeed pushes us for transformation and who is also patient with us when we mess up. A savior who challenges us to listen and who listens to our hearts, our grief, and our confessions as well. A savior who knows what it is like to be human, who has lived in a world with predetermined divisions that we have inherited from past generations and yet works to overcome them and invites us to try because this is what Jesus did in his life. I imagine that just as Mary watched Jesus grow in wisdom, and she treasured what she saw in her heart, that God does the same for us as we learn and grow and ask new questions, as we seek to follow Jesus down this difficult road. Because in doing so, we are helping God build God's glorious kingdom that welcomes all, that welcomes you and me and people who look different than us all as God's children who can live in God's abundant love together. Amen.
This is the time in our worship service where we would normally gather our offering, and since we are worshiping together virtually, we don't have the opportunity to do it in this way. But we want to take this time to give thanks for the generosity of all of you um, in the ways that you support the ministry of grace here and throughout the world. So thank you for your generosity. And you can continue to give uh, online through our new uh, Realm database uh, that you can find on our church website or by sending your offering into the church office. Again, thank you so much. And all thanks to God for providing us with all that we need. Joining together with the songs of the angels, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Lord God, as we look ahead to the new year, we do so with wonder and praise, knowing that whatever the year brings, you will be with us, knowing that however lost we get, you will find us, knowing that you will be by our side. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. We pray for the world that this year we may find the news not dominated by greed and fear, war and violence, but that it rather be full of hope and expectation, and that if it be your will this year, that it may mark the end of our struggle and loss due to coronavirus, and that we also might find peace around the world and restoration of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. We pray for our own country, that we might lead with diplomacy and peace. We pray for our leaders, that they may be filled with the duty to the poorest and the weakest among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Lord, we pray for Grace Lutheran Church, that we might be a visible manifestation of your work in the world that we might ask questions and continue to learn about those who we do not know in our own community, that we might familiarize ourselves with the hurts of those in our midst and use our resources to bring healing and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. You bring consolation to those who weep. Embrace those who feel far off, excluded or defeated, Accompany those living with chronic and invisible illness. Sustain the weak and the weary. Refresh those who labor under the weight of pain or sickness. Today we pray especially for Megan Miller, LaDonna Lilliquist, Linda Wild, Paul Town, Dolly Jubert, Sophia Schmoll, Mark Gotha, Beth Risdorf, Amato, Deb Stang, Abby Larson, Baby Edwin Alexander, BJ Scott, John Brooks, Charlotte Monti, Elsie Weissenberger, Linda Christensen, John Maleka, Joe Bailey, Julie Swedberg, Judy Wold, Colleen Warnamont, We pray for all of those suffering from COVID throughout the world, and we pray for the end. Hear also the names of those we now name silently or aloud before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. God of promise, grant comfort peace, and the hope of Christ's resurrection to all who grieve. We pray especially today for Jan Quick and family upon the death of her sister Marlene, the Hutchison family upon the death of Ginny Hutchison, Lola Money and family upon the death of her son-in-law, Ken Fountain. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Lord, you are with us at all times and in all places. Bless each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Because today is the first Sunday of the month of January in this new year, we are celebrating Holy Communion. 
And so we invite you to gather your wine and grape juice or bread and crackers uh, and come back and join us. I will uh, read the words of institution, then we will pray the Lord's Prayer together, and then I will instruct you to receive the elements. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new promise in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, Father who, art who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. May you be strengthened by this holy food in God's grace and forgiveness. Amen. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. Bethlehem.